Welcome investors to the Absolute Return Podcast, your source for stock market analysis, global macro musings, and hedge fund investment strategies. Your hosts, Julian Klamachko and Michael Kesslering, aim to bring you the knowledge and analysis you need to become a more intelligent and wealthier investor. This episode is brought to you by Accelerate Financial Technologies. Accelerate, because performance matters. Find out more at accelerateshares.com. Welcome, podcast listeners, to episode 105 of the Absolute Return podcast. I'm Julian Klamachko. And I'm Mike Kessler. Today is Friday, December 11th, 2020. Wild week this week. So much that we're getting to the podcast late and pretty much midway through December. Just given all the craziness, we are going to take a bit of a podcast hiatus on the weekly updates, but we are going to be publishing some great podcast guest interviews over the next few weeks. So look forward to that. We are definitely looking forward to some holiday R&R. But nonetheless, let's get into the episode today. Off the top, I mean, Airbnb with just um, IPO madness. Investors are partying like it's 1999. Airbnb shares more than doubling in their stock market debut. Is this company really worth $100 billion? Another crazy IPO, DoorDash, their stock skyrocketed in their initial public offering, not quite triple digits, but close. This market just continues to crave tech offerings, irrespective of the fact that they're losing hundreds of millions of dollars every every year, Uh, no chance of profit in who knows how long. But nonetheless, we chat about, are we in a growth stock bubble? (laughs) And speaking of another bubbly area, frenzied deals in EV SPAC space. Electric vehicle deals are just proliferating. Four SPACs announced EV and EV-related mergers this week. And guess what? They all surged. (laughs) So that's kind of another funny area of the market. And we ask, what's going to halt this frenzy in electric vehicle SPAC deals? But let's get on to Airbnb. Their shares surged 113% in their long-awaited stock market debut this week, just skyrocketing the San Francisco-based home sharing company. They initially priced their IPO at 68. And if we look at how this IPO developed is... They initially set a price range at $44 to $50 per share, then raising it to $56 to $60, pricing at $68, then seeing their shares close at $144.71 on the first day of trading. Gives you some insight into how nonsensical the IPO process is. But nonetheless, I believe the board really tried to price it at fair value, but completely missed the mark, as did their bankers. Given that the stock was up 113%, the company raised $3.7 billion in its initial public offering. So obviously left a lot of money on the table given the value discrepancy. But this was the biggest U.S. IPO of the year. Just voracious investor demand for it. But let's talk about the dynamics of the company because this share price surge is despite the fact that Airbnb has never made a profit on an annual basis, yet has a valuation of nearly $100 billion. And we had previously chatted about Airbnb back in the spring when they went through a distressed financing with Silver Lake. And what was the valuation there? I think it was like $18 billion or, or around that 18 to $30 billion range. And now it's up, what? four or five fold from there. So kudos to Silver Lake really capitalizing on that. And that bet really paid off. But Airbnb really struggled. They're basically like on the, teetering on the verge of bankruptcy during the pandemic lows just because their business absolutely fell apart. But after dropping 72% year over year in April, their business is now down only 20%. Uh, as of September, which is different than some of these other companies IPOing, trying to capitalize on the timing, seeing a surge due to the pandemic, but not Airbnb. Their business was significantly negatively affected, which is pretty crazy in terms of the valuation. Investors clearly willing to look past that when they aren't looking to look past a lot of the other travel aid travel-related stocks. If you look at some of the 
hotel companies and things of that nature. But if we talk about some of the fundamentals, for the first nine months of 2020, Airbnb had revenue of $2.5 billion. This is down from $3.7 billion for the same period last year. They lost in the first nine months nearly $700 million and their valuation is still at about 20 times next year's revenue. So forget about EBITDA or earnings, none of that. We're talking about 20 times revenue in a business in which growth is, I mean, we, we saw massive negative growth year over year. But nonetheless, this eye-popping valuation is indicative of a market that is desperate for, I suppose, the appearance of growth because Certainly, when things normalize, investors expect Airbnb to get back to growth. But this is one of those brand name stocks, like everyone uses Airbnb. So it's got that brand recognition. So perhaps that's just causing uh, a surge in retail buying that doesn't really pay attention to fundamentals. But this has really just been a trend that we've seen for the past number of years, where there's this massive disconnect between fundamental business valuation And where stocks are trading in the stock market, especially for story stocks such as Airbnb, which if you are interested in trading it, is listed under the ticker ABNB. But Mike, what are your thoughts on this? Do you think we're in a growth stock bubble? And is Airbnb like, is $100 fair value up fivefold over the past nine months? Yeah, I mean, the question of whether we're in a uh, growth bubble, I mean, I don't think there's much doubt about that and in particular when we when we talk about airbnb as well as doordash and then we'll be talking about electric vehicle uh, financings as well but like look at airbnb like they've raised 4.4 billion dollars in equity financing so this is like a very late stage uh company that well in reality they did want to be public uh late 2019 and then into 2020 and they kind of built their strategy uh, around going public at that time and so i remember uh when they were trying to go public in 20 in early 2020 um i believe we discussed this before but they had a, a big big issue with their employees was their stock options were were uh like basically coming due in uh in in, in november of 2020 and so that was kind of an issue why they wanted to get out the IPO prior to that um, just for employee retention and and everything like that. But as well, I mean, when you look at Airbnb, they have a $100 billion valuation. Uh, when you compare it to, I guess, DoorDash, you look at their addressable market or core markets and Airbnb, they do have a three point two tr- or $3.4 trillion total addressable market. Yep. And I mean, the market right now really focuses on these total addressable markets. And yeah. you compare that to DoorDash, where their market valuation is actually substantially higher than their core market address, their core total addressable market. So, I mean, there's a little bit of a disconnect there. I mean, total addressable market, you know, it, plenty of money has been raised off of uh, estimates such as that. Um, however, I mean, at the end of the day, are they able, able to make monetize that? Uh, I, I really don't know. But in reality, their business model is simple, at least, you know, really what it comes down to is service fees. And those amount to about 17% of gro- the gross booking value when you do rent a, uh, a, a, a suite, a room or a suite with uh, Airbnb. And that rate, that take rate, to the 17% would be referred to as a take rate, but between the host and guest, where the guest is paying the lion's share of that, they're paying 14% approximately, and the host pays about 3%. I thought there was a few interesting trends uh, in their S1 that were pointed out by uh, Bern Hobart uh, in his Substack article uh, about a few weeks ago, where he, he did point out that domestic travel spending was up 35% year over year. That helps to offset some of the decline in international travel. As well as an, another interesting trend is the long-term tra- long-term travel spending uh, defined as 28 days or more. Uh, that's up 50. percent uh, So you you do have some some interesting trends that were identified in in the granular details of the S1. Uh, but really, what what I highly respect the management team is how adaptable they've been in identifying gaps in the travel industry during the pandemic and really just moving quicker than incumbents. So most notably hotel chains. Uh, And and as well, I mean, we discussed this another time, uh, uh, but uh, the, the whole early pivot to breakfast cereals to, to make their, 
mm. make their uh, <laughs> salary payments and whatnot very early in, in Airbnb was quite interesting. But we're, we're going to discuss uh, DoorDash as well. And just comparing the two, I, I thought, thought there was a few interesting comparisons with DoorDash. You know, you have the expectation that you start out with uh, frequency of use at about five times per year, ramping up to 20 for Airbnb. Airbnb it's it's difficult to imagine people using it more than a few times per year. So you really do, uh, the company does have to really get 100% of your vacation travel mm -hmm. um, if they're going to meet their goals. And I would also note that they're, both of these companies are former Y Combinator companies. So it is a, a very good week for the brand of Y Combinator. But in terms of the the irrational exuberance in in in, in the uh, stock that you've seen uh, since its IPO yesterday, uh, it really just seems like people wanting to be early on the vaccine rebound trade. That seems to be a kind of a common theme when you're looking at the, uh, the analysis of what's gone on. I think it's not very appropriately valued given its, given its underlying unit economics, but uh, this is a crazy market right now. I'll, I'll leave it at that. So, Mike, from a valuation standpoint, are you telling me Airbnb is cheap on an EV per TAM basis? <laughs> yeah, that is a metric that everybody likes quoting right now. So if, if that's your preferred <laughs> metric, which I highly <laughs> I do not recommend, uh, but sure, it would be uh, it would screen favorably on that. Metric. Yeah, it's an interesting dichotomy between Airbnb and DoorDash because you mentioned Airbnb, uh, perhaps a vaccine rebound reopening type play as uh, vacations and travel comes back. However, DoorDash is really the opposite because they're seeing a massive surge in business due to the pandemic. And many skeptics believe that perhaps that is a bit of a pull forward in their business. But nonetheless, DoorDash surging nearly as much as Airbnb in its IPO this week. They priced their IPO at $102 per share. Their shares surged 80% to about 182 as investors just clamored for shares once they did start trading. A bit of background on this company, it's about seven years old, founded by some Stanford University classmates. And ever since, DoorDash has lost money in every year since its founding. But, I mean, you look at its valuation, $72 billion dollars despite losses of $667 million in 2019 and $149 million over the first nine months of 2020. It just goes to show you investors' attitudes these days. It's like they don't even look at P&L or EBITDA or anything like that. They just look at a brand name of the company, oh, DoorDash. I like that. I use that. Go into my Robinhood account, buy the stock. But what differentiates DoorDash from Airbnb is that I believe Airbnb can be profitable at some point. They have an underlying business that I will, I think will generate a lot of profits over the long term. But you look at DoorDash and its competitors, Uber Eats and Grubhub, they're all like famously like tremendously competitive and highly commoditized, such that you got a question, will DoorDash and their competitors ever be profitable? on a sustainable basis? Or is this business model really just a race to the bottom as they just compete back and forth for market share? So that's kind of the question that investors need to take, not just on DoorDash, but some of its competitors. You know, Are you willing to reward this total addressable market potential and revenue growth in the face of never-ending red ink with no real prospect of near-term profits or ever like how do you value a business that will never be profitable that like and the notion of never-ending losses they're gonna have to continuously tap the market and where this business model runs into trouble is you saw it when the last tech bubble imploded after the uh, year 2000, all the companies that couldn't be profitable and were reliant on the capital markets, as soon as the capital market window closes, your business is done. You got to file for bankruptcy because you can't access capital anymore. And that window can close 
very quickly. I had a really funny comment from the CEO of market research firm New Constructs, David Trainer. He called Airbnb, uh, sorry, he called DoorDash, quote, the most ridiculous IPO of 2020. Some of the reasons he cited lack of profitability, huge competition, and he specifically mentioned pandemic pull forward in demand. So he's thinking that they're showing massive growth metrics year over year, year, over year now, just given the pandemic. However, once things normalize, those growth metrics can drop off significantly. But Mike, what are your thoughts? Do you think DoorDash will ever be profitable? Or is this just another indication of this tech stock bubble? Yeah, I, I just want to go over like a, a few more business highlights as well. Uh, and you, when you look at their mar- everybody's quoting their market share. They do have a 50% market share in U.S. food delivery. That's their core business. Um, and, and they actually, I, what I find interesting and, and an interesting case study is they they did form quite a bit after the, some of their main competitors, such as Grubhub. I mean, they launched a, a full decade after Grubhub, which is quite interesting. But they, they really focused and gained a lot of market share initially in the suburbs, where they actually have 58% market share. Um, and it's an interesting case study. I mean, when you talk about the uh, capital raises, they've raised $2.5 billion, wow. um, largest shareholders being Sequoia and SoftBank. So they do have an, a very willing participant to keep supplying them with capital um, in SoftBank. Uh, but in terms of the unit economics, let's go over a little bit of the unit economics first for the restaurant. So DoorDash, they make their money through merchant commissions and then the variable fees from the consumer. Um, so they gave an example in their S1 where the restaurant keeps 61%, uh, DoorDash takes 15%, and the Dash are 24%. And it really just makes you think, at, from the restaurant's perspective, is losing 39% of the total food sale sustainable for any restaurant? And there will be <laughs> arguments that, sure, that DoorDash is increasing the, this is revenue that may not have occurred um, without DoorDash. I, I don't want really want to get into that. I, th- I think some of that or- argument is a little bit flawed as there is some cannibalization there. Uh, but on the unit economics for DoorDash, uh, some of the estimates that I've seen for their unit economics are pretty optimistic. And I'll just give some examples. For for example, I've seen kind of in the range of $6 to acquire each new customer, um, which I, I'm thinking it is a, quite a bit higher than that. Yeah. But as well, a $30 average order um, where you have increased frequency throughout the life of a customer, um, with it, which really works out to based on the, some assumed retention rates, things of that nature, uh, and a le- lifetime value of a customer working out to about $60. Now, that seems very favorable on a unit economic basis. But the main issue that I have would be the low CAC, um, customer acquisition costs, and limited amount of marketing spent on retention of customers. This is a very competitive uh, industry. So I think some of the estimates I've seen are fairly low. Um, and, And why that matters is because this payoff, because of some of really what you'd have to assume for the frequency of of use by the by the consumer, the, the payoff is very back end um, loaded, and so the unit economics are very sensitive to those inputs. Um, but as well, looking at some of that, I do do become a little bit self conscious uh, to see the cohort estimates for frequency when they're talking about using it less than five orders per year, which I am certainly above that on both DoorDash and Skip the Dishes. However, with the unit economics. I am actually pretty impressed by the economics of Dash Pass. So that's basically where you as the consumer pay nine, $9.99, so 10 bucks a month, uh, and then you get free delivery. Well, right now they have about 5 million subscribers, um, which is pretty strong. And so this really implies kind of a on, a, on an annualized basis where they can run, run rate at about 600 million. So I find that part fairly interesting. Um, but really, when you look at this, I mentioned before that their their market cap right now is oh, significantly higher than their core 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 business, uh, like the U.S. food industry, where food delivery being 6% is about $23 billion. Mm-hmm. And so you compare that to their market cap of like $55 billion-ish, um, that, that's that's really unsustainable. So the bull case really relies upon uh, the operational excellence of, of Tony Tony Zhu. And so can he take their 
this logistical platform is as he he really likes to phrase it. I've heard him on a few podcasts. He's he's a very interesting founder. Like op, their operational chops of their management team is is really strong. But they can they transition out of their core market and and take that operational excellence into other delivery areas like groceries and non perishables and convenience and convenience yeah. store items. That the main question, and as uh, that's the bull the entire bull thesis. I do think. I mean you are paying up for that optionality. So it becomes a pretty pretty difficult sell um, from my perspective. Um, I did just want to mention one other thing just with regards to uh, IPOs this uh, over the, over this past uh, past year is that the I, I saw a stat on Bloomberg today that the average first day of return for IPOs was over 35% yeah. uh, over the last year. And it's just a crazy IPO market. Well, and the IPO ETF is up over 100% this year, which is just uh, shocking because historically IPOs have, have not done that well, but this is not a normal year. And clearly investors are loving IPOs these days. If in fact you don't want, do want to get involved in DoorDash, trading under the symbol D-A-S-H, but we'll see this one. Investors certainly ascribing a lot of positivity to the stock and a lot of high expectations. So we'll monitor this one over the next while to see if those expectations come to fruition. So last thing I wanted to chat about is, you know, bull market and IPOs, certainly massive frenzy in SPAC, EV, electrical, uh, electric vehicle, and related transactions kind of just going crazy. We had four of them announced this week, electric vehicle and EV related SPAC business combinations, and all these stocks are absolutely surging. The first one, which I thought was the the funniest one, because it's another case of a cannabis blank check company pivoting to electric vehicles. This one specifically, Collective Growth, announced a merger with LiDAR sensor firm Innoviz Technologies, and its stock rallied more than 31% on the news. Gig Capital 3 struck a deal with Lightning E-Motors, saw its stock rally 28.5% over the past couple of weeks. Back Forum Merger 3 announced a business combination with EV manufacturer Electric Last Mile, and shares rallied 27.4% this month. And lastly, I mean, the big kahuna, TPG Space Beneficial Finance, it's a bit of a mouthful. They did sign a deal with EV charging company, EV Box, and its stock more than doubled overnight. You wake up and uh, the stock's up about 115%. So we are long a number of these in the Accelerate Arbitrage Fund, having acquired them either in the the IPO at $10 or perhaps even below $10, they are significantly above that now. But that's what we look to do is buy pre-deal and capitalize on the SPAC pop of which all of these are showing. Unfortunately, Mike, we are long, are not long of TPG pace. Uh, I don't know what we were thinking that day. What was happening with us? Why aren't we long that one, but long the others? <laughs> Yeah, that's that. It always is a little frustrating, especially when you look at it uh, ex post. It's uh, all, all the winners become clear uh, after the fact, but th that's that's why we ultimately do run a, a diversified book. But uh, when you're looking at this week in general, I mean, this was just a just a crazy week. You have all of these all of these deals being done. Then you also have all the the twenty IPOs this week. Oh and, man, just insane. And Four four point seven billion dollars raised, and of those, this now this I think is the craziest part is that of those twenty IPOs, you only have two that are trading at a discount to their their NAV, and those and ones were un only, overfunded trusts too. Exactly, yeah, <laughs> both those funded overfunded their trust to ten dollars and fifteen cents. Well, so the the wild thing is that basically every IPO was massively oversubscribed, like three to four times, if not greater. And we subscribed to a number of IPOs this week. And our allocations were as low as 20%, but I think 60% at the high end. So it just goes to show you that it's extremely competitive out there. And there's effectively unlimited demand for SPACs right now. So if you're a sponsor, then I think you can get one off the ground pretty easily these days. 
Yeah, exactly. And and just to highlight a few few other things is is the the pipe financings. And if you look at the Lightning E Motors, I'll just give a couple examples where they have a hundred twenty five million dollar pipe. Uh, for the Form 3 deal with Electric Glass Mile, they had, a, I believe it was a $150 million pipe. Um, where, and when you combine those with the trust value, which assumes that these will continue to trade at a premium and they don't have a, a you know, a majority of their trust uh, redeemed. Yeah. You know, these, these companies have a, a lot of capital to, to deploy. In uh, Lightning, you have over 300, 320. $25 million. I believe on that deal, a large portion of the pipe was actually a convertible. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. And so like, yeah. And I, I, and with electric mile, you have, uh, four, they'll have $400 million to, to boy. And I mean, th- these pipe financings where really these, they're, they're exposing these EV companies to a more traditional set of investors a lot earlier than would historically be the case. Like historically, this would still really be the domain of VCs, but this really this this transfer from late stage VC money to some of these more traditional, we're seeing large large banks, uh, their growth arms are getting involved, or uh, mutual fund companies that that are getting involved in this space. You know, this is really out of necessity, just given the absolute dollar amount of growth growth capital being raised. Yep. Like, there's no other way that they would be able to raise this this type of money without without institutional backing from from these larger players. Just relative to to venture capital, there's just a lot more money in kind of some of the more traditional areas of the market. So I just thought that was kind of interesting to point out. Is you know, there's there's just a ton of money being raised right now and it's a lot at a lot earlier stage than than some of uh than historically and you know these aren't companies like doordash and and airbnb that that have been around quite a bit longer um and more i i guess top of mind from the investor community but it, crazy times indeed and it really shows the the difference between traditional ipo and SPACs because SPACs is really to raise a tremendous amount of growth capital for much earlier stage companies. Meanwhile, uh, DoorDash and Airbnb are a bit more mature and uh, significantly larger than what we're seeing in the blank check space. And a comment on the pipe financings because every hot SPAC deal comes with a fairly large pipe financing and it's no surprise why, like Fidelity and Wellington and those kind of long-only mutual funds are big into it. Those long-only mutual funds that are heavily benchmarked against the S&P. So if you have the opportunity to buy stock that you know is buy stock at ten dollars that you know is going to trade instantly to thirteen, you know that's great P&L going into the end of the year that will perhaps help you beat the benchmark and earn a big bonus. So. You got to look at where the incentives are and on these pipe deals clearly the incentive is to get cheap stock, you know, show a good P&L gain into the end of the year and as long as that dynamic exists, like the pipes are fed by the SPAC pop. If the SPAC pop goes away, I think the attractiveness of these pipe financings to a lot of these long only mutual funds is really going to decline perhaps but it's just a theory of mine i guess we'll see but uh mike these uh ev spac deals what's gonna stop them i mean once every ev company is public and there's nothing else to do perhaps that will be the end of it but as at this point there really is no end in sight in my opinion yeah, no, there really isn't, and then I guess then theoretically, SPACs will move over to the uh, the next hot sector and uh, see if investors have have an insatiable demand for that sector as well. You know, as Jim Cramer says, there's always a bull market somewhere, and we've seen time and time again there's always a hot story. So I'm sure we'll see something after the EV boom has uh, played out. But that about wraps it up for us. This week on the Absolute Return Podcast. Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, definitely leave us a review. Check out more at absolutereturnpodcast.com. Certainly follow Mike on the Twitter. What's your handle? It is M underscore Kessler. And you can find me at Julian Klamachko on the Tweet Machine. And like I said, 
No more sort of weekly insights and analysis, but we will be dropping a few really good interview podcast episodes over the next few weeks. So we'll chat with you in the new year and hope you have a great holiday season. Best of luck with your security selections and good luck with your investing. Chat with you soon. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to the Absolute Return Podcast. This episode was brought to you by Accelerate Financial Technologies. Accelerate, because performance matters. Find out more at accelerateshares.com. The views expressed in this podcast are the personal views of the participants and do not reflect the views of Accelerate. No aspect of this podcast constitutes investment, legal, or tax advice. Opinions expressed in this podcast should not be viewed as a recommendation or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell any securities or investment strategies. The information and opinions in this podcast are based on current market conditions and may fluctuate and change in the future. No representation or warranty, expressed or implied, is made on behalf of Accelerate. As to the accuracy or completeness of the information contained this podcast. Accelerate does not accept any liability for any direct, indirect, or consequential loss or damage suffered by any person as a result of relying on all or any part of this podcast, and any liability is expressly disclaimed.